All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, for today, from the Orland Park Public Library, we have grassroots historian, writer, and activist Owen Keen. He will tell us the story of the LGBTQ downtown disco scene of the 1970s and 80s as told through the story of the popular Chicago queer entertainer, The Bearded Lady. So without further ado, on Mr. Owen Keen. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, it's really good to be here. And I hope you enjoy the story of Dugan's Bistro and the legend of the Bearded Lady. While chronicling LGBTQ community and the gay disco scene of the 1970s and the 1980s, I was exploring a population that was mostly underground, partially censored, sometimes closeted, and often under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Time has taken a great toll on memories. Many key players in the downtown glitter scene were lost in the AIDS epidemic. Others died of natural causes. They took their stories with them. To resurrect the era, I used a framework of facts enhanced by internet and archival exploration, newspaper accounts, fluff pieces, advertisements, journals, police reports, and medical records. However, the goal of this book was to capture the era and the life of the bearded lady. To achieve this meant that the foundation of this book needed to be primarily built from the memories of those who loved and were loved by him, as well as those strangers whose memories of the bearded lady were central to how they recollected their own lives. Dugan's Bistro and the Legend of the Bearded Lady is a folk tale bio of a time and place that were key in the evolution of Chicago's LGBTQ community. The Bearded Lady's story is a gateway to telling a larger story about the nightlife and exuberance of a lost generation, as well as the story of a life after the party ended. Throughout the book, my goal has been to present the Bearded Lady and the crucial times in our history that his story embodies as best I could given the resources. Not all the memories and anecdotes may be completely accurate, but sometimes truth is greater than the sum of its actual parts. Sometimes truth is legend. The Bearded Lady, also known as BL, whose real name was Robert Tice, preferred the pronoun he, but responded to she as well. BL was just pleased people were talking about him. The bearded lady was heavyset with a mane of brown hair that hung halfway to his ass. His full beard frequently sparkled with glitter and his manicured nails were long. The pinky nail on his right hand was especially long, which often meant scoop and sniff in the disco era. His makeup was theatrically gauche. Some described his makeup kit as his box of crayons. BL was fond of kimonos and sunglasses, jewelry, five inch heels, parasols, and opera gloves. But his signature props were the hand fans that he used with coy abandon both on and off the stage. At the bistro, BL appeared Thursday through Sunday at midnight and 2 a.m. for two 15 minute shows. Technically, he was a theatrical dancer, though he didn't dance so much as hop and move and turn. His appeal didn't lie in his dancing skills, but in his dancing attire. BL was layered with clothes. As he moved, he went through a kind of metamorphosis, shedding layers and transforming before the audience's eyes. The effect was spellbinding. BL's drag was never about the glamour, but always about the reveal and the surprise. His performance, his act of transformation, was an apt metaphor for the newly liberated gay community and nightlife scene at the time. His persona, both on stage and off, was one of unbridled joy, silliness, and being fabulous, not in spite of his imperfections, but because of them. BL was about possibilities and becoming. He was thrilled to be having such a glorious time and his mood was infectious. The crowds adored him. The Bistro was the brainchild of 26-year-old entrepreneur and party man, Edward L. Davison, AKA Eddie Dugan. Dugan saw the trend in music and felt a change happening in the bars. The gay community was coming out of the shadows and proclaiming their recent liberation. 
Dancing for same-sex couples, which had been illegal only a decade earlier, was becoming a big part of the celebration of those newfound freedoms. In 1972, Eddie Dugan, who had been working as a bartender at Broadway Sam's, went with his boyfriend Ron to PQ's. Eddie was accustomed to the dark, filthy, and windowless look of gay bars during the period. PQ's offered the expected, a long bar with some tables and chairs, but the club also featured some things that were unusual, like a series of display cases with assorted miniature vignettes in the front seating area, as well as an enormous painting of Mae West. The main draw at PQ's, however, was the music. The back of the disco had a horseshoe bar with a DJ booth above. That fateful night, a DJ was spinning records and the tiled dance floor was packed. Observing the crowd, Ron turned to Eddie and shouted over the music, if you open a place like this but five times the size, you'll be a millionaire. The comment resonated. Dugan had worked in enough gay bars by then to realize he could offer patrons more than what they expected he could give people something they didn't even realize they wanted. Eddie Dugan looked at several possible locations before choosing the four-story building at 420 North Dearborn, formerly occupied by the French restaurant Le Bistro. Seizing the opportunity, Eddie borrowed $5,000 from his parents to match the $5,000 acquired from his business partners and signed a 10-year lease. He kept the Bistro sign, but put Dugan's above it, and the latest Chicago night spot was born. Eddie Dugan had been blessed with the Midas touch, only instead of gold, he turned everything he touched into a party. As a bar owner, Dugan, Dugan had an invaluable gift, a charismatic knack for approaching each person at the bar and within two minutes, making that person think they were the reason he was happy, they were the reason he came to work that night, and they were even the reason that he opened the bistro in the first place. Then he would move on to the next person and convince them of the same thing. With Eddie at the helm, the bistro soon became the premier club of Chicago. The disco scene was growing and the bistro was leading the way. The sound, the concept, the ambiance, the bistro pioneered ideas that eventually became the disco norm. Dugan's bistro tech, set the mold for a new kind of club defined by decadence, outrageousness, excess, and excitement. Though it's often referred to as the Studio 54 of the Midwest, the, bistro, the bistro's opening predated that iconic New York night spot by four years. Some may have been surprised by the immediate success of the bistro, but not Eddie Dugan. He knew how to throw a big, fabulous bash, and the bistro was all about having a big, fabulous bash every single night. Despite the demure club motto, the bistro, nice people doing nice things for nice people, outrageousness ruled. Patrons never knew who or what they might see. The surprise element heightened the anticipation of going there because staying home might mean missing something people would be talking about for weeks. And from the beginning, people were talking about the bearded lady. In the corner to the right of the VIP lounge was a small stage which was nothing more than a four foot by eight foot piece of reinforced plywood mounted on posts and elevated approximately four feet from the dance floor. The stage was accessed from the rear by a few steps with a door at the top, which had a mirrored back and opened directly onto the mirrored stage. As a result, the stage resembled a music box. The platform was the domain of the bearded lady. At midnight and 2 a.m., the music would end, the flashing lights would go still, people would stop dancing, and the bistro crowd knew what was coming. The opening chords of Love's Theme by Love's Unlimited Orchestra would begin. A spotlight would illuminate the stage. BL would appear oftentimes with his back to the audience, a move and practice that he sometimes referred to as giving back to the community. His hips would start to sway to the music. The crowd responded with cheers and whistles. As the shouts escalated in anticipation, BL would turn. He would be wearing sunglasses with the rest of his face mostly hidden behind a hand fan. 
Love's theme would segue into BL's other signature number, Who's That Lady by the Isley Brothers. As the song moved into the first stanza, the crowd would begin to chant, Who's That Lady? In response, BL would slowly lower his cat eye sunglasses to look over the crowd. The audience would erupt. As the song progressed, the layers of clothing would start to be shed. BL was fond of twirling each removed garment a few times before casting it aside. BL's clothing layers were mostly comprised of thrift store house dresses, but always included a few surprises. <clears throat> A poncho might be removed to reveal a house dress, and then another house dress. With another series of moves, he would be in an, a jumpsuit, and then in another turn, he might be wearing gauchos and a peasant blouse. Another house dress, a slip, a nightie, a corset, a bustier. The number of layers and the amount of clothing Biel was able to carry on his body was astonishing. He usually ended his act in a one-piece ladies' bathing suit with his hairy legs and body on display. The main criterion for his outfits, aside from the final reveal of the swimsuit, was that they have buttons, snaps, Velcros, or zippers. No item of clothing could go over his head because BL often wore some sort of headdress or hair extravagance. BL's hair and beard were adorned with lawn ornaments, blow-up toys, knitting needles, fresh flowers, kitchen utensils, sex toys, a bird cage with a stuffed bird inside, doll parts, pink flamingos, flags, plastic fruit, and countless other items. Once he even wore a sparkly gold rotary phone on his head with the receiver hovering in space and an attached conversation bubble that said, hello. The third number in BL set was typically a popular hit of the day. Though the third song varied, the one thing that remained relatively constant was BL's unfamiliarity with the lyrics. The crowd didn't care. They didn't expect BL to lip sync. That wasn't what this illusion, this visual explosion was about. The crowd loved him even more for not knowing the words. Accompanying all this were the screams. With each layer of clothing removed, Biao shrieked with delight. In response, the crowd screamed and stomped their feet. With each layer, the, crowd, the cries escalated. As the frenzy grew, Biao broke from his sometimes flirty, sometimes demure stage presence to scream or cackle in reply. The cries on both sides increased. BL had the rare distinction of being a club act that needed the dance music to resume in order to calm down the revved up crowd. Dancing in a hot club, wearing layers of clothing, and being overweight, it's not surprising that BL sweated profusely. Rather than being a negative, the sloppiness was merely another aspect of his glorious imperfection. His celebration of being himself made others feel comfortable. The sweating also helped explain why hand fans were his props of choice. Occasionally, occasionally, BL's costumes and props were thematic. For the holidays, he wore a Christmas tree dress with blinking lights that plugged into an onstage socket. Sweating profusely and incorporating electricity into the, his outfit carried a risk. More than once, BL suffered burns due to the combination. Performance fashion sometimes meant suffering for his art, and he wore the scars to prove it. At graduation time, he appeared in a cap and gown with pencils, diploma, a team pennant, and an inkwell hidden in his hair and beard. When schools around the city were celebrating prom, BL performed in a white satin creation with lots of tall, the seams in his prom dress had Italian lights stitched in, which pulsed to the disco beat. On his head was a five-branch can five candelabrum. Sometimes the theme behind, themes behind his attire were less obvious. BL once da danced to Linda Clifford's If My Friends Could See Me Now, wearing a long pink gown and a paper mache cow head. The explanation for the fashion choice was in the lyrics. What a setup, holy cow, they'd never believe it if my friends could see me now. This is from a 1974 <clears throat> Chicago Sun-Times piece on the first anniversary of the Bistro. 
A sturdy figure wrapped in a white coat resembling tablecloth damask came out, green lights flashing under the coat at chest level, illuminating its pattern. Rows of ruffles jiggled under the coat hem, revealing high platform shoes. At first, one only saw his back, but at last the figure danced a half-turned reveal behind a turquoise feather fan and white plastic rimmed dark glasses, the bearded lady. As eager fans handed up folding money, he took off layers down to a Carmen Miranda dress over a bra. During his bistro days, BL compulsively scoured resale and thrift shops for new outfits. Though he proclaimed himself the queen of Ann vets, he enjoyed junking at other thrift stores as well. To see BL in any retail environment was to see him in his element. He was always talking and flirting. He would pick up this and that, often something colorful or sparkly or strange, and would begin wondering out loud, what can I do with that? How can I make that into something? What if I bought a dozen of these? Anything and everything had outfit potential. In his dingy downstairs dressing room at the bistro with assorted lockers, tables, and mirrors, BL kept piles and garbage bags of garments and frocks, accessories, and props. Every night, BL rummaged through the piles to put something together. If a garment didn't quite fit, BL got a pair of scissors and made it fit. In addition to the bistro basement, BL's wardrobe dominated his own apartment. For years, he lived in a studio on Briar between Broadway and Sheridan. Friends picking him up for work or play were rarely allowed inside. He was what many might label a hoarder. His apartment had pathways to walk through with clutter and boxes and clothing piled floor to ceiling in area, areas. After living there a few years, BL's landlord caught a glimpse of the inside of the apartment and promptly evicted him. BL moved to a larger apartment in a brick six flat at 4408 North Dover, where a forest of clothing racks held the brunt of his massive wardrobe. Although the bistro, Chicago nightlife, and the LGBTQ community were evolving, BL's act remained relatively the same. Love's theme, who's that lady, current hit, hand fans, sunglasses, layers of clothing, the consistency didn't hurt his popularity. His fame only seemed to increase. Sometimes he made exceptions. When he performed Honey Bee by Gloria Gaynor, he came to the stage through the back of the bar instead of from the back of the mirrored stage. There was BL in a gold lame beekeeper's outfit with netting, a feathered hand fan, and a headdress resembling immense insect antenna. Trailing along in his wake were drones, young gay bees in yellow and black carrying hat boxes and flowers, lampshades and robes. The message was clear, BL was queen of the hive. With the bistro as his platform, BL became a star. Comedian Phyllis Diller applauded him. Bruce Valanche referred to him as Chicago's living legend. Gay life hailed his infectious lunacy as Chicago's answer to Bette Midler. He posed for noted photographers like Chuck Shotwell and Mark Hauser, glitz and glitter artist Bob Fisher, also known as the Windy City Warhol and who called his art bizarre, immortalized him in an oil painting. BL was a bona fide celebrity. People shouted to him from passing cars and called his name from department store balconies. On the street, some people asked for a picture or an autograph or both. He was always thrilled to oblige. BL adored his public as much as they adored him. He was routinely featured in gay and straight presses alike for any number of reasons. He attended dozens of nightlife events, play openings, fundraisers, and restaurant debuts. He performed at the opening of the Music Hall of Man's Country and ruled at the Pride Parade. He wrestled in cake butter for charity and ended the match by licking his opponent into submission. People joked that he'd show up for the opening of an envelope. In 1975, at the showing of The Pig and I, a love story for the Chicago International Film Festival, the film's Porky star was squealing in the lobby. 
Eager to hog some of the spotlight, BL picked up the piglet, put it next to his face as the cameras flashed. The image of BL and the pig was all over the papers and television the following day. At a David Bowie concert, BL received media coverage after arriving in an enormous polka dot antebellum gown with zebra print shawl and a huge Southern Bell hat festooned with ermine tails hanging from the brim. Over the hat was a surfeit of black bridal netting with, the, with a bow tied beneath his chin. He carried an enormous silver fan and his beard sparkled with glitter. Each press photo and every column mentioned prompted BL to be more outrageous in his public appearances. He showed up in costumes ever more over the top and sporting an I have arrived attitude. He was ready to cause a commotion, which he did at a film screening from which he was turned away because his enormous headpiece was both too high and too wide for people to see around. On July 11th, 1977, he was prominently featured in a Time Magazine piece on the punk music phenomenon in America. In the shot, BL wore silver platform shoes with black and gold ankle ribbons, silvery hose with garters, a leopard print hot pants top combo, gold workout belt, black coat, pink sunglasses, and a biker hat with a pink floral purse slung over his shoulder. His leopard print top was open, revealing two slabs of meat on his chest that had been fashioned into a bra. When Time Magazine hit the stands, BL was over the moon. He came onto the bistro of the stage that night wearing red, white, and blue sequined outfit and with lit sparklers in his hair. As the music started, he began shrieking and spinning in a euphoric whirl. Eventually he stopped and screamed, your mother has made Time Magazine. Once he became a name, BL had various agents and representatives who tried to book him on The Tonight Show and other programs. Although he garnered attention and was undeniably a phenomenon, his performance did not transcend the moment. His persona was too scattered, too unpolished, too unpredictable, and maybe a little too gay for the mass palette. Middle America was not ready to have this avant-garde sensation in their living rooms. But it didn't matter. For those who knew BL or knew of him, his live persona was so commanding that when discussing the opening of Chicago's chicest new boats, clothing boutique, the Chicago Sun-Times writer reported with tongue-in-cheek precision, the bearded lady was not there. He had achieved so much notoriety that even Chicago Tribune arts columnist Claudia Cassidy mentioned his arrival at an event on her popular half-hour program on WFMT. Hearing his name uttered by Assidy Cassidy, of all people, BL felt he had indeed arrived in more ways than one. Celebrities did not intimidate the bearded lady because he considered himself one. In 1974, when Rudolf Nureyev was in town with the National Ballet of Canada, he came to the bistro. The Chicago Tribune reported that BL approached Nureyev and asked him to dance. Nureyev said he had just danced two shows and was tired. The bearded lady told him that he'd just danced two shows too, but he wasn't too tired to dance. In November of 1977, the week before Thanksgiving, the Turning Point opened in Chicago. Shirley MacLaine was in town promoting the film and was coming to the bistro that evening. In her honor, BL performed Turkey Lake wearing a tutu and accompanied by a live turkey, also in a tutu. Unknown to BL, two bistro employees had fed the turkey a laxative. So when BL picked up his feathered dance partner and spun it around, there was an additional surprise. BL wasn't thrilled with the shitty outcome, but he was elated when he discovered that he was the talk of the town the following week. A firm believer in more is more, the following year's Thanksgiving showstopper had BL performing in a pen filled with live turkeys. In December 1977, Bette Midler was performing at the Park West in the midst of a huge snowstorm. Midler was one of BL's favorite entertainers, so during the performance, BL approached the stage in full regalia to give Bette a bouquet of flowers. Seeing him, Bette stopped mid-song and said, 
oh, honey, you look like shit. The comment brought down the house. On the black asphalt and vinyl dance floor of the bistro, celebrities rubbed elbows with the LGBT community and edgy disco files. A number of patrons were eager to add to the frenetic atmosphere, especially if their ability to shock got them through the door faster. This is from another Chicago Tribune piece, Swinging at, B Swinging at Dugan's Bistro. The bistro brought together people who looked like go-go boys, construction workers, Indian princesses, vampires, prom queens, and Betty Davis. Sometimes partygoers at the bistro even encountered street people from the suburbs. As its popularity soared, the bistro became one of the first venues in the city where gay people mixed and partied with straight people in a friendly atmosphere. As the Chicago Magazine once wrote, sooner or later, everyone ends up at the bistro. When it came to door policy, Eddie Dugan was adamant that heterosexuals would never be the norm at the bistro. He made it emphatically clear to every doorman on their first night of work that the bistro was primarily a gay club and he intended on keeping it that way. He wanted outrageousness and fabulousness. He wanted sexy, sweaty, bare-chested guys on the dance floor. He wanted same-sex grinding and the hint of homosex in the air. Eddie was unshakable in his resolve to protect the gay vibe. Nights when the bistro teetered on the brink of being too straight, Eddie encouraged flamboyant and raunchy dancing among the gay patrons. Eddie liked to scandalize the straights who wanted to experience the wildness of a big city club. More than a few in the community were eager to sex up the dance floor and give folks something to watch. In a 1974 interview, Eddie voiced his surprise at how being gay has caught on. It sort of puzzles me because gay people usually like to be left alone and suddenly the whole scenes become fashionable. Fashionable or not, Eddie, liked to, Eddie made certain the scene was never boring. To emphasize the anything can happen vibe, Eddie was known to encourage drag dancers to get up on the main oval bar and kick every single thing off the counter and onto the floor. Drinks, bar napkins, ashtrays, cigarettes, everything went flying. Afterwards, Eddie had the bartender replace everything and gave those at the bar a free round of drinks. Eddie knew people would repeat the story about the crazy thing that happened at the bistro last night. He considered that the best kind of advertising. Having interesting regulars was another kind of publicity. And at the bistro, there were plenty of them. There was Regina, the dominatrix, who typically arrived with her submissive husband on a leash, a woman who wore an outfit made of chains, the diaper disco baby, the vampire couple, the music lover who was fond of dancing with the 33 and a third record affixed to his hair, and many others. The professional song and dance group, The Cycle Sluts, whom the Hollywood Reporter called band, bard, and x-rated, stopped by the bistro whenever they were in town. <clears throat> the dozen or so members with names like Gloria Hole and Lola Loin arrived in full makeup and leather gear. Most members were seven feet tall and teased hair and heels. Members of the macho drag group snaked through the bistro before making their way out and heading to the next bar. This free form of promotion let every gay person in the River North area that, that night know the cycle sluts were performing in town. Eddie liked the theatrics of it all. The appearance of the cycle sluts was something else people would talk about. However, the biggest draws at the bistro, the biggest, one of the biggest draws at the bistro was Eddie himself. One Saturday night, Eddie rode a motorcycle about the interior of the bistro, zipping around the perimeter of the dance floor up to a cheering drunken crowd. Another night, he instigated a fire extinguisher fight with an employee. Eddie's birthdays were always something to behold. His 1980 birthday party had a Roman orgy theme, but the bash was more than a toga party. Eddie had the entire four bartender, four drink station of the front bar covered with plywood. Fountains and greenery were added for atmosphere. 
In the lush setting, Eddie reclined on oversized pillows and had gorgeous young men in G-strings fan him with palms and feed him grapes. He also had a hole drilled in the ceiling above the dance floor. At midnight, he descended through the opening and into a bathtub. Once he was lowered, a group of scantily clad young men stepped forward and filled the tub with champagne. Eddie's birthday the following year had a circus theme. For the event, wild caged animals were brought into the bar. When the man arrived with the animals, he discovered the lion's cage was too big to fit through the door. Eddie decided to let the lion out and have the cage disassembled and reassembled inside. While the task with the enclosure took place, the lion was tethered in the bar and eventually rounded up to get back into his cage. At midnight, Eddie swung from the ceiling on a trapeze. At the same party, another entertainer emerged from the ceiling hole in the palm of King Kong's hand to perform a production number. Eddie's birthdays were always a spectacle with free drinks and cavorting galore. One or two or even more naked guys usually jumped out of the cake and most shirtless boys in the club ended up covered in cake frosting. The loft department upstairs was popular for the hush hush after bistro party where drugs, alcohol, and nudity were even more plentiful. More than once, Eddie was known to appear in drag at these bashes as Vicky Edie. The bistro private parties were legendary, and Eddie knew the power of legends. Holiday decorations at the bistro were something else people talked about, something else you had to see. During the holidays, the, beach, the bistro featured mountains of assorted wrapped presents, Christmas teas laden with ornaments, automated elves, Santa Claus, reindeer, sleighs, snowflakes, tinsel, and holiday lights by the hundreds. One year, the bistro had a decorated tree hung upside down, blinking lights and all. Beside the tree were upside down gifts, an upside down rocking chair, and an upside down Santa and reindeer. Each year, the bistro decor grew more and more extravagant, and being part of that became a tradition for many people. This is the triumvirate of the bistro. That's Eddie Dugan and standing is Lou DeVito, who was the DJ extraordinaire. Uh, and then also sitting beside Eddie is T.L. Noble, who was responsible for many of the surreal concepts, the party theme, uh, the decor, and he was also the stage manager of the bistro. For the Bistro's sixth anniversary party, patrons were asked to dress in either black or white or both. The staff wore red. Before opening the doors, Eddie gathered the employees outside for a group picture. After a few photos, there was a bang. Mylar ribbon shot from the roof, streaming across Dearborn and Hubbard. Cars swerved to avoid the tangle as over 1,000 miles of ribbon were launched to celebrate. The festivities also included 100 pounds of glitter. Patrons noticed a few flakes of glitter a block away, then a dusting, then a layer covered the sidewalk. By the time they reached the bistro door, the red glitter was ankle deep. The bistro was a snapshot in time, a happening, a party. But in spite of Eddie Dugan's Herculean efforts, Parties don't last forever. Property values in the River North area were on the rise and the neighborhood began to get cleaned up. The bistro still had lines down the block on weekends when the building at 420 North Dearborn was sold to a Canadian, forum, Canadian firm just one year before Eddie had the option of renewing his 10-year lease. The party was over. Given the grim news, Eddie decided to do what he did best. On May 31st, the disco's ninth anniversary, Eddie threw a party with a black and white theme. The final night at the Bistro was a party to end all parties, with, according to the Chicago Tribune, over 2,000 people in attendance. As with the eighth anniversary bash, there were six different cakes, each adorned with a letter that spelled out the word legend. The world-famous club closed 
on May 31st, 1982. Four days later, wrecking balls demolished the Studio 54 of Chicago. The day was cold and drizzly. The bistro walls fell in a cloud of dust, but within the haze was a shimmer. Gold, red, and silver glitter sparkled on the sidewalk and in the gutters that rainy day. Some said it was in the walls, and others suspect someone left a few bags of glitter in the building to add sparkle to the plume of destruction dust as a final bistro hurrah. In the end, the bistro, ground zero of much of Chicago's LGBTQ community's outrageousness, became another parking lot. Eddie was devastated to lose the bar. He confessed he could have run the bistro for the rest of his life. The day after the demolition, Eddie, Lou, and TL sifted through the rubble for 100 broken bricks, unbroken bricks. He wanted some of his favorite people to have a piece of that magical place. The bricks were numbered one to 100 with attached brass plates that said, there's no place like the bistro. Thanks, love Eddie. He called, the he called the bricks Bistro Headstones. Just prior to the 1982 closing of the Bistro, BL met and fell in love with a young teacher named Jeff Bruce. Jeff was moving to Tokyo in the fall. After a whirlwind romance, BL decided to join him. He was ready for a change. Divesting himself of all his stuff was not easy, but BL managed. His career in Tokyo was very different from the one he had in Chicago. Japanese gay bars at the time were very small with little room for entertainment, especially for a talent the size of BL. He did perform at private gigs, including a birthday party for Stevie Wonder, but in the end, he needed a career change. He began teaching English as a second language and found he had a natural knack for controlling the attention of his students. He considered teaching to be a lot like a club gig. In 1985, after three years of sporadic performing, studying Japanese, teaching English, and shopping in Tokyo, a call came from Chicago with a job offer. A revamped version of the club Coconuts was opening. Would he be interested in performing there? After some discussion, Jeff and BL decided to return to Chicago. That summer, BL went to work at the Resurrected Coconuts, and that fall, Jeff went to, to Northwestern for his master's degree. As you can see, the vibe at Coconuts was a little bit different than it was at the Bistro. BL's Coconuts experience was different than his earlier appearance at the Bistro. At 38, BL was more settled. He was also drug-free and less frantic in his day-to-day -day life. Disco was dead. The crowd was different as well. The community had been radically altered in the last few months. In the 1970s, police harassment had fostered camaraderie in the newly liberated community. That wasn't the main issue anymore. By the mid 1980s, AIDS had begun to decimate Chicago's gay population and its specter cast a pall upon the community. Countless numbers of bistro customers, bartenders and staff died during the pandemic. Eddie Dugan, the life of the party, died of AIDS at age 40 on April 10th, 1987, in the midst of the construction of Bistro 2. As per Eddie's wishes, I Love the Nightlife played repeatedly at his visitation as dozens of relatives and friends passed by the open casket and dropped flower petals inside. At the service, a statement by Eddie was read, asking friends to think of him at those times when they were having the most fun, at parties. When Lou DeVito started getting sick, he became reclusive, only allowing a few close friends to visit him. On September 18, 1991, AIDS claimed the life of the DJ extraordinaire, the man who brought the music and the crowds to the bistro dance floor. Lou was 39. In February 1986, BL appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show in an episode about New York-based celebutants, as club personalities were called at the time. By that point, BL had been a celebutant for over a dozen years. He wasn't on the panel, but had a prominent seat in the audience. On the show, he stood wearing daytime BL regalia 
and ask the panel, what do you do when you're out of the spotlight? What do you do at home? Given the changes in his life and the world he had known, BL's question seemed especially reflected, reflective. Oprah seemed overwhelmed by it all. While BL was in Chicago this time, he got his degree in art history and often knew more than his instructors. When he returned to Tokyo, he began go, going to art exhibits and openings and was soon a very recognizable figure at those events. He also started collecting Asian art and sculpture. His collection eventually grew to thousands of items. He also began painting. His work was primarily colorful abstracts. He usually, he even had a couple exhibits and Bio refused to do anything drab and prided himself on never owning a tube of black paint. In 1993, he came back to Chicago again, this time to get his master's in English as a second language. Afterwards, he returned to Tokyo and to Jeffrey. He loved his students and was consistently named the most popular teacher in his school. BL found ways to communicate that were beyond language. As the millennium drew to a close, BL was diagnosed with a rare blood cancer. Both his father and grandfather had succumbed to blood cancers. In 2001, his condition worsened. To survive, he required frequent transfusions and steroids to force his pancreas to produce blood. Despite his illness, BL was still a ruling queen who would hold court for those who visited his hospital room on the 11th floor. When a recently published author showed up at his bedside, BL demanded a signed copy of the book before promptly falling asleep. In the end, despite his passion for collecting clothing, jewelry, and art, BL didn't care about things anymore, just people, just that Jeff and his friends and his family were there. He was aware of what was happening and of the grave nature of his illness, but he also knew there was nothing he could do about it. He became resigned to the inevitable. BL was at peace with himself. During his hospital stay, BL sometimes talked in his sleep. In those times, he was heard to say things like, here we are in the south of France, and oh, this is most elegant. Mostly during those final days, he just wanted Jeff to hold his hand. His final words were, I love. He died during the third summer of his illness on June 18th, 2003. BL often professed that he wanted to live to be 100. He died at age 56. BL's body was cremated. Three days later, Jeffrey hosted a funeral service in their home. Coworkers, friends, family, and students overflowed the interior. Oddly reminiscent of his days at the bistro, the line of people assembled to honor him one last time snaked down the block. They came to pay their respects and light a stick of incense before his ashes. It was said that the smoke could be seen for over a block away. At B.O.'s request, Masoni handkerchiefs were distributed to the mourners so they might grieve in style. To combat the heat, those in attendance were given hand fans. As a result, each of the 83 mourners in the cramped quarters were cooling themselves with a hand fan, looking like a large gathering of butterflies fluttering before BL's ashes. The visual seemed a fitting send off. A small amount of BL's ashes were cast into the Yangtze River in China, where he had gone on many trips to acquire art. The remaining ashes were eventually inurned at the Columbarium Wall at Chicago's Graceland Cemetery. BL left behind a great deal. This is one of the things he left behind. This is one of BL's scarves. Okay, so BL left a great deal behind. Some things he hoarded, like clothes, and other things he accumulated. His collection of artifacts primarily consisted of Chinese and Japanese ceramics and pottery. He also collected bronze Buddhist and Hindu figurines from China, India, and Southeast Asia. Upon his death, he wanted all his art pieces to go to a museum, but the pieces, though varied and impressive, were not considered museum quality. Jeff spent years selling some items and giving others away. 
he tried to give some sort of memento to everyone who had known BL. And this is one of BL's little bronze figurines that Jeffrey gave me. Although BL was in many respects a hoarder, in the end, he didn't keep much from his days in Chicago. A keychain from the bistro, right here. A keychain from the bistro, some photos with friends and fans, a binder of publicity photos and newspaper clippings. BL's biggest keepsake from his time in Chicago was a magnificent life-size bronze made of his head in the mid 1980s. B.L. was many things in his life and many things to many people. As in his iconic performances, B.L. was comprised of layer after layer after layer. He was a court jester, a crazed genius, and a force of nature. He exuded the gay community's unbridled joy and captured the absurdity, electricity, and strange beauty of the era. B.L. was beyond proper pronoun usage. He did gender fuck before gender fuck was a thing. He was a pioneering radical fairy working as a go-go boy in a gay urban jungle. He was an art collector, an artist, and most importantly, a work of art. BL was his own creation. He was persona as performance. BL's enduring message was don't worry about being modest, being appropriate, or being too over the top. He was all about celebrating beauty and the ecstasy of the moment. He saw us all in a constant state of changing and becoming. Move, shed, turn, transform. Thank you very much. And thank you oh, for sure. presenting for us today. That was very interesting. And especially with now, with having the Pride being canceled on Sunday, at least we oh, got yeah. a bit of history today. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. It was a very interesting story, and I, I wasn't expecting the artifacts at the end. <laughs> I really oh, like yeah. that. That's, like, really cool. Oh, yeah. It's, um, you know, it was odd. I started the project, and I, it originally was going to be about four, uh, four performers in the 70s, four different performers, and I started... As I started writing it, it became more about BL. And then I was, I was talking to someone about it and I ended up, a friend of mine is good friends with um, Jeffrey, his, his widow in Tokyo. It was so weird. So, I mean, I couldn't have, it wouldn't have happened if it wouldn't have reached that level. Um, because that allowed me to just have so much more access to the different images. I had quite a bit beforehand, but um, like in the book, there's a lot more about his life in Tokyo as well. It's really interesting because it's just so culturally fascinating and how he maneuvered his way through being all these, all the different aspects of being of art and being of creating art and being art and you know, appreciating art and studying art. It just, it, I was blown away by, um, by just what a character um, the bearded lady was. Yeah, it was like, it's, I know I keep saying it, but it was just a really interesting story. I've never heard of the bearded lady before until today. And well, honestly, I'm glad to have heard about it. <laughs> well, and what's so odd is that, um, like, the bearded lady at the, I mean, in the seventies really was that pot. I mean, the Tribune and the Sun Times would cover the things at the bistro a lot. And it was a gay bar. I mean, that's really to for gossip columns. And, and it was, the bistro was a huge celebrity magnet. I mean, the comparisons to studio 54, can't be, um, can't be, compared enough. I mean, it was any celebrity who came to Chicago, that's what they did at night. You know, they yeah. pretty much went to the bistro. Um, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, of bearded lady stories and, you know, um, different incidents and, and things. Just a, a completely larger than life character who just, like, 
I'm, I'm just shocked that at some of the things that, that went on, it was, um, it was certainly much wilder than I think we give credit for. Uh, when we think of that era, we don't quite think of it as being that crazy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, like some of the parties from the, the bistro were just insane. It sounds like his stories were tamed down a little bit. <laughs> they were tamed down. Oh my word. I mean, even tamed down, it sounded like a fun place to be. <laughs> it sounded it's like very a memorable, which is what which is what Eddie Dugan always wanted. I mean, he always said that the more outrageous it was, that's just the best kind of advertising, you know? Mm -hmm. In the era before videos and cell phones, you know, you had to make fun at bars. And a lot of times the bistro helped make that fun because once, once you would get the outrageousness at a certain level, it would make people so uninhibited because there was always something crazier going on. You know, it wasn't like anyone was going to be self-conscious about themselves because something crazier was going on right next to them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is there any, are there any like connections between like, um, anything that like what that was going on with the bistro to like any of like the like any drag shows you would see today or anything um i think i actually think the bearded lady in some ways was very um i think it's i think the bearded lady is almost like a very would be an avant-garde kind of drag act today i mean i think we see a lot more in that the bearded lady was a blurring of genders, you know, rather than, um, than anything else. And it was, the bearded lady wasn't trying to be female. He wasn't trying to be male. He was just being himself as this sort of um, composite of male and female, you know? And I think it's, it's actually gender wise, very sort of, um, uh, very contemporary i think yeah it is like i'm not quite sure how things were in the 70s on how like they perceived gender mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. then i wasn't not quite sure how it was but i know now like that does seem like a pretty very modern idea yes i think at the time it was i in most of what i've done through the 70s i mean there was um a lot was performance, but the performance was more about um, uh, like a lot of, of um, almost more imitation or homage. Um, there wasn't really as much of just sort of someone getting up and doing an act as themselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, even his lip sync was never, you know, he would never know the third song. Like it would, he would, he would just do stuff and he couldn't really dance. He would just do the layers of clothing. And he was just so wacky and having so much fun that it just, it was infectious and people loved him. And the odd thing was, is that it became, it, that it felt, it, it um, uh, went over into the mainstream, that it even became like, he became a, a celebrity in Chicago. It's, it's such an odd footnote in history because, I mean, when you start looking through things, there's, a there's so much coverage in, you know, Chicago Magazine, the Tribune, the Sun-Times, um, just different, different things, Time Magazine. I mean, it's just odd that it's, um, well, Time Magazine was just a photo. That really wasn't, um, wasn't coverage, but, you know. But just the fact of, of someone being um, so kind of of an era. And what's interesting is that when he goes to Tokyo, after the bistro closes, he had been working at the first incarnation of Coconuts before he moved there. But when the bistro closes um, and he goes to Tokyo for three years and then comes back, everything's completely different with AIDS. And it's sort of like, so much of what had gone on before 
is almost um, like it's such a different world that he's kind of a relic almost. But even when he came back, when he was performing at Coconuts, the crowd still loved him because he was kind of nostalgia for a, for a, um, for a simpler era, you know, a pre-HIV world. Cool. I see that we do have an attendee here. If you had any questions, you could put it in the chat and we could read them off if you had any questions. seem to have any. So I think, yeah, no questions, but that's okay because I'm I covered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast. I had a lot of material to cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it was just fine. But once again, thank you sure. for taking the time and presenting this for us and giving us just like a bit of Chicago history. And like I've lived in like the Chicago East suburbs and like it's my main city mm -hmm. um, for 23 years and I've never heard of the Bearded Lady. So you yeah, the new it's lady. like a, like the bistro itself. It's just like a moment in time, you know. And it it came and it went and it's um, I loved writing about it. I've never had more fun researching a project. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice when you have like that one project that just like really, really gets to you. And it just like makes you want to do more and more and more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, and just talking to people about their stories from the Bistro. I mean, they were never, you know, I never go like, oh, ho, ho, another, you know, not another <laughs> Bistro. I mean, they were always a crazy story. Yeah. I'm sure that <laughs> you have like plenty more of those stories in the book. <laughs> yeah, there are quite a few. <laughs> 100%. And if anybody wants to check it out, could you um, say the name of the book so people can Sure. Can the name of the book is Dugan's Bistro and the Legend of the Bearded Lady. So if you wanted to read into that, see some more of the crazy stories, you are more than welcome to. And once again, thank you to our presenter. And thank, thank you, you for all. Me. Oh, yeah, of course. And thank you all for tuning in. And I hope you guys have a great night. Thank you, Orland Park Library. <laughs>